Back to you, Neil. Hi, and uh, welcome to another episode of Access Chat. Today, we're really pleased to have Lisa Seaman here with us. Lisa is uh, a shining light in the world of accessibility, her, having um, been a, an editor of the ARIA standard and also now is leading the work of the Cognitive Accessibility Task Force uh, to look into how we make the web more accessible for people with cognitive accessibility issues. It's a huge task. Uh, it's a hugely ambitious project, and uh, gosh, we're well. We're really pleased that that someone like Lisa is able to come here and talk to us and um, you know, lead the world in changing how we interact with computers for people like myself and people with on the autistic spectrum, and and, and also people with uh, you know things like uh, Alzheimer's and dementia and people. You know, who, who, who are unable to speak. It's a huge topic, it's massively diverse and um, really thankful uh, to have Lisa A championing the cause and, and, and B here talking with us tonight. So welcome Lisa. Thank you, no pressure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> welcome Lisa. Um, Thanks. So, um, I think we are all, you know, in my, I'm curious, uh, how did you get involved, what motivates you and how did you get involved in all this? Ah, um, I got involved in accessibility, I think in 1999, <laughs> when I was, um, I was making um, content um, and, and uh, online tools for people with different learning disabilities and ADD uh, coach and early intervention system for um, dyslexia and stuff like that. And um, Study Web wrote, wrote to me at the time, um, who were a big homework site um, on what they could do to make their content more accessible um, for people with learning disabilities. And so I thought, oh, that's an interesting question. And I did a bit of research and I contacted the W3C and said, have you addressed it from this angle as well? Because WorkEgg 1.0 was just, they were just wrapping it up. And they kind of said, well, actually, um, we, we've, we've, had some suggestions that we ought to uh, pull in more people who are in that topic so why don't you join <laughs> so i did and and the rest is like history <laughs> okay thank you thank you and you think it, when you look to you know uh, to, all, to all the uh, to to the fact that you know you get involved in all this uh do you see uh that the what are the ma the major challenges uh, for making web web accessible for people with with cognitive uh, difficulties um so i think the biggest uh, challenges are not the technologies they're they're in attitudes i think we we need people to see the huge opportunity this is um to reach more people and include uh, uh, include more people and and have more more customers, um, and um, and and to get people to view this as an opportunity as opposed to a cost. Because often with accessibility, people see it a bit like the IRS, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and and as much as you you may approve of a lot of what your taxes go to, um, you don't like paying taxes, you know. So this is this is in a bit of a different space because uh, you know it might never reach. Um, any any requirements um, that aren't voluntary, but it it may be um, extremely useful for people who want to um, include more people who want to have their site usable by uh, people with disabilities and um, and people who just have cognitive decline from aging, or people who are just having a bad day, you know, because often someone's anxious or a bit depressed, their their short term memory is less good, <laughs> and and things often go wrong because you just find it that bit harder to concentrate. Um, and and does a company want to lose people's businesses because they've designed a a, um, a site with a higher cognitive load? Um, for people, they're making it harder for people to buy, um, and I, I think a lot of people, when they they see it in that kind of light, they think, no, actually, you we, we want people to buy, <laughs> even if they are, you know, <laughs> not uh, not a uh, twenty-five year old. <laughs> the, uh, are you are you somehow uh, in touch with with, with new companies uh, with startups? 
sorry with are you, that, are you in touch with with startups with new companies and i know uh, because i'm i'm curious about t to know if uh, that people are developing a new software a new app how open they 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 are for 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 these type of challenges gosh not not enough but that that's that's an interesting point yeah, I, I, th I think what we often see is that larger, more um, established companies have probably been bitten a few times, um, have come across accessibility issues, uh, the awareness is, is, is raised. Um, whereas I think a lot of startups, a lot of young people, uh, firstly, you know, they're young, they still feel invincible. Um, not all of us. But um, and I'm not that young. Um, but we, you know, when when we were young, we felt invincible, didn't really um, feel the need, and and therefore there's this lack of understanding of the perhaps the the importance of some of this stuff. Um, that said, uh, I, I'm with Lisa. You know, the cognitive load is really hugely important, not just for um, people like me who have short-term memory issues, um, but it's important to the successful completion of, you know, order baskets of people ordering tickets of people being able to find the information. This is this is the key. You know, that the, it goes hand in hand with um, usability in, in UX, and and there may be subtle variations into the reasoning as to why we want to do stuff so that we're relating it back to um, specific learning difficulties or or cognitive decline due to aging or whatever but but they are still absolutely pertinent to making some uh, you know making products and services on the web easy for everyone to use and therefore probably more profitable and successful well I, I think a, a, a big driver um, if we're just looking at this is an opportunity is the aging uh, market because um, studies have shown Nielsen uh, particularly I'm thinking of um, um, showed that usability goes down by about 0.8 percent every t every year from age 25 um, and that means that um, s people the mature market is is about 35 percent less likely to complete an online sale that they start. So in other words, in, in that huge market of, of you know, older boomers now um, and, and the golden generation, etc., that, that you have people who try to buy your product and fail at a rate of 35%. And that's, that's got to be bad business. I don't think people can afford that, really. Um, so, and that's before you even think about, will they ever come back? Um, and I, I have a similar, you know, um, dyslexic, um, quite heavily dyslexic. Um, and um, I was booking a trip to China, um, quite an expensive trip. And um, I, I tried to do it on one of the big sites. <laughs> and I spent ages and I copied over my passport information and all this kind of thing. And then it was, it was giving me a real headache. And then the session timed out, all my data was lost, and uh, I called my travel agent. And then the next time, about three months later, I had some kind of trip to book, I just called my travel agent, paid the commission, saved myself three hours of, of pain in this site. Um, now that's silly. <laughs> and also the, the, um, the older users, are um, they're the, they dominate most consumer goods in, in terms of spending. They, they ha they're the people with the money. So if you're thinking of, of making a site that's got to be profitable in the next five, ten years, you know, you really want to include uh, these end users. And the kind of, um, the kind of um, issues they, they hit uh, are going to be issues across, uh, there's a lot of commonality between um, different uh, disability groups and as people um, age, uh, the same kind of usability problems are, are going to hit both groups. Um, so I, I, I think there's a huge market and, um, and people need to differentiate themselves. So I, I, think there's, I think there's a real opportunity. It's not just a lip service. Well, Lisa, I, I know that Neil and I are fortunate to be part of your subcommittee and you're doing 
the lion's share of the work along with a couple of others. But, you know, it, it, I think it is interesting that when we talk about cognitive or intellectual disabilities, many people will think of, um, like my daughter, 27-year-old with Down syndrome, when in actuality that isn't what we're talking, I mean, we are talking about including her. She's an example of, even though she has Down syndrome, she's a whiz on the computer. She, as a matter of fact, talk about taking away bandwidth. You know, I'm constantly saying, okay, stop, you know, do it on the iPad, the iPhone. The she's really, really strong on technology. But the multitasking that we do, it causes cognitive loads. And the, um, I just think, there is a lot of misunderstanding about this particular topic, and it's critical. Even the points that you're making with 35% of people aren't completing that purchase. That's a huge number. And I remember um, buying tickets for my daughter, as a matter of fact. We were going to go see a princess on ice or something. And so I was multitasking, and I was, I was on the... Um, the ticket site and I was filling out the information and all of a sudden it timed out and I thought, oh, okay, pay attention. So I went back in and I lost the seats. I went back in. This time I was paying attention. I was doing less multitasking. Tried again, timed out again on me. The third time I went in, now I'm mad and I'm determined I'm going to do it. And I was like a, a soldier doing all the steps and I actually got the seats and I thought, my mother, my mother couldn't accomplish that. And so right. many... I couldn't accomplish it, but I just got stubborn. So I think this is a very, very important topic that we're talking about because it impacts everyone, and it, it impacts the bottom line. So I, I just think the work that you're leading over at W3C, it really is important. I also think it's interesting to note that in the United States, with our Section 255, which deals with telecommunications, We've had, we've tried to have some of this language in here, but we weren't exactly really sure what to do with it. And I know that at some point when we refresh our uh, Rehabilitation Act, the Section 508, we are as a country trying to address some of these things and certainly letting W3C lead us and, and sort of help us understand what we need to do. But um, there does seem to be uh, there does seem to be a lot of efforts that are trying to pay attention to this, but with you um, under with W three C really taking the lead on it. Yeah, um, I think something that W three C can do that other places can't is make sure that the underpinnings in terms of the languages used on the web, the coding standards, support um, any improvements that we we we, we find truly useful. Um, and, and although we are talking about this huge scope in this huge market, there, there is the other case of people with severe cognitive disabilities um, and there's content that they need to be able to use too. Um, and some of that is, is, is critical. Um, and, and that there is really important. We, we think not just of um, what, what's got the huge usability um, aim, but what will really help these people get the critical information that they need, um, emergency services and stuff like that. And it's a cross-information technology. Um, I, I, I kind of, um, the, I, I have a lot of problems with these phone menu systems where you call up and they say, you know, press one for this and press three for that and press six for the other. and I've got to hold in my mind the six whilst I'm processing the term that they're using, which isn't an easy term, and figuring out if that's where I'm, and then I've forgotten the six, and I, I get lost and I get thrown off. And, and this happens to me when trying to make a, a doctor's appointment. It even once happened to me when calling the police. And that's just insane. And if we can put some standards in place, such as any emergency service, any healthcare service, you press zero, you will get to an operator. It's an easy digit right. to find. You can find it in a time of stress. Um, you can find it if you're unwell. Those kind of standards um, can actually save lives. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. Uh, I also get lost. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the fear that we have to overcome on, on behalf of the companies that implement these systems is that people will abuse these systems. 
Um, and, and, and that's a real fear and a business impact that, that we have to address because, yes, I, I totally agree it's going to be much better, but um, with my other hat on, we run lots of service desks uh, for, for, for my organization and we get thousands and thousands of calls and if everyone knew that they could effectively <laughs> jump the queue by pressing zero, um, ah. they, they may, they may, um, they so may not don't like make, that. don't make them jump the queue. It can be a hold. Yeah. You can, unless it's the police yes. or an ambulance, you can have to sit there for five minutes. I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I well, just, in five too. minutes, I want to get somewhere. Get somewhere. That's so, what, you know, you, uh, you can encourage people to use the other systems, but I think you have to let people get to human being if you value what you're giving. Yeah. If you think what you're giving is absolutely useless, by all means, if it doesn't work in the first place, <laughs> make it as inaccessible as you want to. <laughs> but if 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 what your product you're offering is important, then then make sure people can get to it. I think it's ever more important as governments are, are pushing people to be more independent and use services on, on their own behalf. Yeah, you know, this work's crucial. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's the other thing. Um, my my dad has Alzheimer's, and we had um, um, we got we got him a new television set, and it came with three remote controls, um, each with about thirty buttons. In, and 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 the words that they'd use were things like source instead of going between TV and video. It said source, and he's meant to figure that out. And it wasn't going to happen. Um, so now it's it's on one channel, <laughs> and he knows how to turn it on and off, and that's all he can do. He can't change the channel by himself. Um, and his heating system is he won't let. He's also got one of these ICT interfaces, these screens interfaces, which means he can't really manage it by himself. So the, he's, there's a design metaphor that he was used to, which is the on-off button and a dial for volume, <laughs> higher or lower, and that's gone. Um, and so now he can't turn on and off the heating. Well, that that is, you know, for someone who really doesn't need living care, you're pushing them to actually need living care. If you can't turn on television, if you can't turn the heating on and off, then you need a lot more care. And what, what a waste. What a waste for everybody. No, I, I agree. And, and, and actually, I have a similar problem with microwaves. So we actually spent a long time going and searching for a microwave oven with two dials, one for the heat setting and one for the time. And that's all I need. Thank you. I can use that. <laughs> Why, why do I need something with 63 different menus and, and well, you press lots of beep? It doesn't work for people. And, and, and you know, simplicity is, is really, you know, it, it benefits everyone. Right. And you're welcome to have all these extra features, but stick them in a corner that says more, you know, and keep those two dials that, that we used to okay. and that we know, or give people different options of different interfaces when they, you know, set it up if they want to do something fancy um, but but yeah let but let people be able to use it the main three functions that they're used to using yeah I, I have another problem with um, heating so we have underfloor heating in my house which uh, I either put on manually or or not at all because I I can't work out how to program it. Well, I could if I could be bothered to spend three hours doing it. <laughs> and, and, and so it never gets used. It's something that I acquired when I acquired the house. And I, I really just don't want to put myself through the effort of trying to work it out. It's just you know, something like a dial. It may not look as pretty. It may not be sort of smoked glass, but it's easy to work out. Maybe they should hide it behind smoke glass, and then everyone would be happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think mean, that's it. That's exactly it. It 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 it's, it reduces your product. You know what you're what you're giving people. So, Lisa, I know that the the cognitive group is published. Um, and can you talk about that? Sure. Um, We've actually just published um, some background research, <laughs> but we have published it. So when we when we um, it doesn't come out with many solutions, it, it, but it, it we've looked at eight different user groups um, 
quite diverse user groups and try to identify um, where their challenges are when using you know technology web technologies and um, um, and and described um, cognitively what's going on with them normally <laughs> so that um, so, and, and, and it's going to be the basis of, of doing a gap analysis and trying to solve these problems uh, that, that they're facing. So, um, and ma making a roadmap in the future uh, and, and a gap analysis. Um, so if people want to take a look at it, it would be a very good time for them, for people to say, hey, you missed something. Um, or um, I have ADD and this is what I can't do. Um, and that's really the thing that we want to hear the most is if you have a, um, a cognitive uh, impairment, mild, severe, um, what is it that you, you, you call someone else to do or you avoid or you first can only do first thing in the morning and then you can't do it anymore because <laughs> you're too tired. Those, <laughs> those are the kind of things we want to know um, because then we can see if there's something we can do about it and rec make recommendations. Um, and hopefully make it easier. So take a look. Um, um, uh, can we publish a link somehow? <laughs> I, I published the link on the NHS website, so it, it, will, yeah. it will be there underneath your biography. Okay, great. So um, that's it's worth looking at. Um, it, we know we've got stuff missing, and we know our citations are a mess <laughs> and inconsistently done, and uh, other other things like that. But we wanted to publish it. Um, as a first draft so that we can start getting these really important comments and, and find out if there's stuff that we've missed or pieces of research that we just didn't know about, um, which obviously can happen. <laughs> um, so we'd like people to yeah. take a look. And also, uh, uh, what would be the best way for people to reply to and take, to engage with you uh, in terms of that feedback? Um, so there's an address for comments in in the um, abstract in the introduction um, and also uh, you know what my my email address is is quite well available <laughs> so you can you can also just email me um, but uh, but the working group to give it to the ta to give it to the task force um, it should go through the, the comments um, email address Okay, I, I, I've got a sort of hot topic that I know has been part of our um, discussions on, on sure. the task force, and, and that's about um, the flat design paradigm that, that's everywhere these days. Um, you know, you can make a, a, a flat design website that works brilliantly with screen readers and assistive technology, but I think it you know, produces a particular challenge for people with cognitive difficulties because of some of the the sort of design language and, and the, the way that everything is, is put together. Um, ha, have you seen uh, good examples? Can you point us to good examples where flat design takes into account cognitive accessibility issues? Um, well, I can't promise because I haven't done any studies on it, so I'm, I'm would guess um, that actually, you know, the Windows 8 button to um, where it, it kind of goes in more like an app mode and you've got that flat design of, of the different apps. Um, um, personally, the things I liked about that is that each clickable region is clearly defined. So when you click, you know what you're clicking on. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Um, and is often missed in, in flat screen design and didn't have so much in the way of, you know, drop down menus and stuff like that. So um, um, I, I think that one's not bad. Um, it also depends. One of, one, of the, one of the problems, though, I think is in, in general is um, every time you change the design pattern and metaphors that you're using, uh, people have to learn them. So even if it would be easy if it was the first thing that you're learning, if you're used to a different way of doing it, then um, then that can be tricky. So um, and a classic example is, you know, how do you, the, the start button having gone in the early version of Windows 8, people were used to using it and then they had to learn new ways. And I think you don't want 
users to have to learn too much. Um, but I thought in general the toggling was a good idea so that people could get used to it, but when they didn't know how to do something they could just revert back to the comfortable design that they were used to. Um, so with a few kinks along the way, I thought that that wasn't wasn't bad. I, 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 you disagree. Well, this is fine. No, no, no that's <laughs> fine. I, I, no, I agree with you about the the, the, the defined regions. Um, I have other issues with the, with the the flat design schema, particularly on the mobile devices. I think it's getting better, and I think it's used it on mobile. Uh, I think it's becoming uh, more mature, and I think that in Windows 10, which is the, the the latest iteration, it's it's looking like a significant step forward. I still I still find it more difficult. I think that a lot of this is driven by the fact that everything's going on to you know trying to scale across screens. So it's people want to be able to do something that's easy, that's scalable, that's responsive, and flat is a good answer to that. But um, at the same time. Um, you do have all of these things that you're talking about, people having to relearn how to use stuff, and also um, content and functionality being hidden, being obscured. You know, um, I couldn't work out how to close an app on the iOS 8 for a long time. Uh, sorry, iOS 7 for a long time. I kept trying to close it the old way. It wouldn't happen. No one had told me that I needed to swipe it upwards. No, it's easy when you know how, but if you're not told, if, if they've changed the, the usage paradigm, then then they need some way of pointing that out to the users because it's going to cause people like my parents to machine right. bog down. My so dad then, has 53 apps running at any one time because he doesn't know how to close it. <laughs> and and, and let's, <laughs> let's, let's get back to the problem of expecting people to learn. And um, this is a, a thing of you, when when things that are less usable become actually inaccessible is when it means uh, there's a group of people with a disability who now can't use this thing. Um, when someone has mild dementia, uh, they may be able to use things that, um, that they've used in the past for years and years, um, or, uh, um, even early to moderate stage, the um, Alzheimer's. Um, but but what's really difficult is learning something new, or rather, you can teach, you can learn something new, but the next day you have to learn it again. So that when you are saying, oh, it's easy when you know how, and someone's told you to swipe it up, that's fine. But but that's for you, Neil. But if someone has, um, you know, early dementia, and you tell them, oh, swipe it up, and they say, oh, right, great, all right, okay, I know how to do it now, I'm good. Uh, but then come back tomorrow. And you have to tell them again. It's not that learning process isn't is has really slowed down, um, and that really that's going to mean it's you know it's over that you've been able to use that app is now. It's a really history. good point, <laughs> and, and it's one of the reasons why I, I, I plead with my parents: don't update. Do not be tempted to press the update button. You know <laughs> how it works right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and they automatic updates. We are automatically going to change it all on you, and we're not going to tell you about it. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to let you roll back. Yeah, um, no, and they're, they're right. painful. Um, I've had experiences where um, you know I've, I've been arguing on the phone, but I can't use it anymore. It's inaccessible. You don't care. You've done it now. Too late. Um, it's 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 a tough it's a tough one, and and I understand why companies like Apple want to uh, you know bring people onto the latest platform. It's supportable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at the same time, the that rollback path, that fail safe, is isn't there. Um, right. And it's it, it, as you said, you are you're effectively disabling people by changing. It's like walking out of your home one morning, coming back in the evening, and everyone's moved the furniture around without telling you. Right. Where the hell is your credit card? It used to be kept here, but it's yes. not anymore. Exactly. Go find it. You know, and, and you're meant to be able to function, and you just, you know, you can't. You found your bed, you're crawling into it, staying there. You know? um, and, and, and we don't want people to do that. And uh, it, it's just more more and more um, web technology um, in one form and the other across devices, it's the way we're going to interact with, with 
with our society and we have to allow people to do that we have to we have to help them and these are important devices you know so uh yeah it's important to allow back back backward compatibility really of the user user experience and uh, I, I would say to anyone that's watching this we are not um discouraging technology, you know, updates and change and innovation. We're not discouraging it, but to take something that's already working and mess with it every single time, it really is so frustrating. And I understand why they do what they do sometimes. I know that whenever my whole family had the iPhone 4 and um, they, you know, Apple upgraded to the oper the new operating system, and we couldn't upgrade it on some of the iPhone 4s, and so we were forced to, you know, upgrade our phones. I get the business reasons, but it really is frustrating when you make things more complicated than they need to be. But, Lisa, we really, really appreciate you talking to us about this important topic today. Um, I think we could talk to you about this for years and learn so much from you. We... Um, and I think we're going to have a real lively Twitter chat about this today. So we we hope that you'll come back and chat with us again. And I know Neil and I love being part of your subcommittee. And um, Antonio adds, you know, a lot of real depth to um, these conversations as well. So uh, we really, really appreciate your time today and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Look forward to chatting to you tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa.